the full story of the face-off between the Soviet Union and the United States after the Second World War has remained secret for more than half a century. This was the Cold War, when two superpowers both had atomic bombs and were threatening each other with total destruction. Dozens of nuclear accidents, they called them broken arrows, had resulted from the deployment of that dreadful weapon. Through censorship and reasons of state, those sensitive dossiers were all repressed. But now declassified documents can reveal the facts about those catastrophes that led humankind to the brink of apocalypse, and the lost bombs of the Cold War are finally exploding into sight. On August 6, 1945, the bomber Enola Gay dropped the atom bomb they called Little Boy on Hiroshima. And the world entered the nuclear age. President Harry Truman had provided devastating proof of American power. He'd brought Japan to its knees and fired off a warning to Stalin, whose expansionist aims were becoming troublesome. The USSR had millions of troops and thousands of tanks. Since the end of the war, the Red Army had been only partially demobilized. Truman was counting on fear of the bomb that he alone possessed to hold them in check. He kept on testing more and more bombs and urging his engineers to turn the prototypes into real mass-produced weapons. But then, the first Soviet nuclear test took America by surprise. And thus began the mad race for nuclear supremacy. The first American hydrogen bomb went off in the Pacific on the Marshall Islands. It was 100 times more powerful than the one at Hiroshima. Nine months later, the Soviets had their own. And the race was on. The Americans tested Castle Bravo a bomb 150 times more powerful than Hiroshima. Khrushchev's response, the Tsar Bomba, was a monster three times again more powerful. The terrifying escalation had reached its peak. Mutual assured destruction of, was a doctrine that both the United States and the Soviet Union operated under that uh, we could maintain peace as long as each side was vulnerable to an attack from an from the other side. So uh, they were both assured of, of destroying one another so they wouldn't have any incentive to launch the first strike. But this was a strategy that placed American bomber crews under intolerable pressure. We asked the US military during the Cold War to do the impossible, be ready to launch nuclear weapons on a moment's notice and never, ever have an accident. That's impossible. We shouldn't have been asking the US military to do that. So to me, the lesson of this is that going on nuclear alerts, that's inherently dangerous. It's very risky. Since the end of the war, there had already been 28 nuclear accidents fortunately without any contamination. Mars Bluff in South Carolina, Goldsboro in North Carolina, Yuba in California. 
The risk was at its height in 1966, when the government insisted that American bombers should be permanently in the air and on high alert. We start flying routinely B-52 bombers with thermonuclear weapons on board. And we did that because Strategic Command believed that if there was a surprise attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, the bombers on the ground might get destroyed. And for the sake of deterrence, they wanted to have some weapons in the air all the time. Thus it was that on January 17, 1966, at a base in North Carolina, four nuclear bombs were loaded onto a bomber plane for a 24-hour mission. Captain Windorf and Major Messinger knew they might at any moment receive the order to drop their dreadful load. It was a show of strength in which the pilots were true American heroes. The plane would cross the Atlantic, fly over the Mediterranean, and head up to the very edge of the communist bloc to be in position for a nuclear retaliation. On the return flight, they had to refuel in flight over Spain. One quarter mile dead ahead. Pilot, roger. Looks good. One quarter mile. At 30,000 feet, approach maneuvers to a tanker aircraft are tricky. The slightest error can prove fatal. The telescopic boom was deployed to transfer the 13,000 gallons of highly inflammable jet fuel. But there was turbulence, and it all went wrong. 15 degrees. Roger. Moving left. 20 degrees elevation. Break away. Break away. The tanker aircraft exploded, killing all four crew members. The bomber was badly damaged and span out of control. Four of the crew managed to eject. The nuclear bombs were expelled from the hold. and the plane crashed near the village of Palomares on the Andalusian coast. A reporter, Rafael Martinez Durban, was among the first at the scene of the crash where three bodies were found. People were already there from the village. And my first impression, I don't know what upset me more, the sight or the smell. It was a mixture of jet fuel, rubber, smoke, and burnt flesh. The undercarriage had landed just yards from a school where 20 or more children were at their lessons. It's a miracle they were all right. Four members of the B-52 crew survived and were looked after by the locals. It was the first nuclear accident on European soil. A few hours later, the arrival of U.S. Air Force mine clearance teams caused quite a stir. They'd never seen a helicopter before in Palmares. The teams immediately started searching for the four bombs and were astonished not to find them there in the wreck. With help from the locals, they found three of them, scattered here and there in the village. These declassified photos show that the first had landed in a dry riverbed, apparently intact thanks to its parachute. But that wasn't the case with the two others. Two of those weapons, the parachute did not deploy on. So when the weapons impacted the ground, 
the 300 pounds of high explosive in those weapons exploded, scattering the active material over the area. This extraordinary footage shows the mine clearers recuperating fragments of the bombs. There was no nuclear explosion, but the bombs had released a large quantity of plutonium and the contamination was enormous. As for the fourth, it was nowhere to be found. And that immediately put things on the highest alert. We had a few for the US Air Force, it was vital not to drop their guard and let the Soviets take advantage of this accident. The government decided to continue its deterrent overflights. 24 hours after the accident, the American bomber started again overflying Spain with nuclear arms. At some point, someone in the Franco region said, OK, that's absolutely crazy. No, we still won't, we don't know what is happening. So on a state, we have other nuclear armaments overflying Spain. So they request officially to cancel overflights with nuclear armament over Spain. President Johnson was unhappy about this and tried his best to change Franco's mind. Their two countries were bound by a 1953 agreement. American forces had paid one and a half billion dollars to be allowed to install five military bases in Spain. Since they were halfway to the Soviet Union, they were strategically useful when it came to nuclear deterrence. They were home to 12,000 GIs in a permanent state of alert. Two of those bases immediately sent 300 soldiers to Palomares. In the afternoon, the buses full of soldiers arrived. We knew they were Americans because they were all black. We'd never seen a person of color before. The men were sent straight off to search for the missing bomb. They could at any point have been exposed to radioactive debris, but they wore no protection. But wherever they went, the Geiger counters went crazy. The contamination from the bombs had formed two long parallel corridors. They covered an area equivalent to 200 football fields. Here in this region, there are strong southeast winds, and they spread the radioactive dust. And this was an inhabited area, with crops too. Urgent action was called for. And the first thing was to stop any more of the dust from spreading. The local people still had no idea how serious the situation was. Later, they came around with this device for the radioactivity. I had this little window at the back, and they put this thing there, and it was full of radioactivity. They didn't say anything about bombs. They just said not to touch anything and not to go out at all. But everyone was already outside to find out what was going on. I didn't know it was a nuclear bomb. I just didn't know. We didn't know much back then about nuclear bombs. After five days spent systematically searching the whole area, the military realized that the bomb must have fallen in the sea. The United States' 6th Fleet was stationed in the Mediterranean, so was ordered to locate and recover it as quickly as possible. It must not fall into foreign hands. 
The stunned residents of Palomares were experiencing all the power of Uncle Sam, and they have never forgotten it. All the tools they brought, the sheer cost of it, the equipment they had, you just can't imagine. It was incredible. Within days, a military camp had been set up on the beach at Palomares. Commando teams of divers were combing the whole coast. And state-of-the-art U.S. submarines had been called in to search the open sea. However, all this activity ended up catching the attention of the press. One of the first decisions that the, the Americans and the Spaniards decided, took was don't close completely the area. They don't evacuate the area. So that allowed also for the journalists to come to the area and then talk to the people. In Palomares, there were reporters everywhere. They were interviewing people and talking to witnesses. It wouldn't take them long to find out things the military would rather cover up. Back in the States, the first to go to press was the New York Times. Franco was furious that he couldn't control this often sensationalist foreign press coverage. A dozen ships from the American Sixth Fleet are now helping the Air Force in the search, codenamed Operation Broken Arrow. Cruisers and destroyers with sonar equipment have been trying to locate the lost bomb and also screening the approaches against enemy spies. Spanish civil guards and secret police cordoned the area around the American camp and Palomares. But Colonel Skip Young, the information officer, wouldn't even admit there was an H-bomb missing. No comment was as talkative as he would get. Also, the, the Soviets used the Palomares incident to criticize the United States and Spanish and, uh, and Franco regime. And the propaganda went wild. With images like this of an arrogant American officer leaving a trail of death. But this was the Cold War, and no holds were barred. So the Soviets incited Western European communists to protect against the dangers of imperialism. And more and more concerned citizens were joining in. At Palomares, it was a publicity nightmare for the Air Force. They, they released what had happened. The Air Force tried to get rid of the problem as quickly as they could. The decontamination operation began. The crops were all covered in radioactive fallout. They had to be destroyed. People in Palomares made their living from tomatoes, and overnight, they lost their livelihood. Their crops had all become nuclear waste. The military's method for getting rid of them was simple, but not a particularly good idea. You can't burn something that's radioactive, because if you do, the smoke becomes radioactive, and you create another problem altogether. This declassified footage gives a glimpse behind the scenes of the huge clear-up. They'd given up on the burning now. All the plants were thrown into specially made drums. But then there was the soil itself. It too was contaminated. <laughs> 
The sheer volume of it was enormous. They'd already used thousands of drums. The U.S. government was getting worried about the expense of it all and trying to limit the cost. There is clear documents where they renegotiate between the Spaniards and the Americans, and it was difficult because it was not so easy on other part of the, of, of the land, so they agreed to, uh, to let some contamination there. Eventually, the Spanish agreed to lower the permitted levels of radioactivity. That's where the real problems began for Palomares. In return, the Americans, who'd been intending to just leave everything there, agreed to take all the waste back to the United States. Another enormous expense for the government. But there was more to it than that. Professor Moreno has come across a document that proves that the Americans deliberately cheated to keep the cost down. Also, we realized that in some of the, the, the places, the only thing they do was to put the, the contamination on the bottom. They put it on, on one meter deep um, from the surface because they thought those lands never will be, uh, you know, removed. When the soil had been turned over, it no longer set off the Geiger counters. On the surface, it was all clean and its owner even got a certificate of non-contamination. But when the land was again cultivated, the radioactivity was still there, a veritable time bomb for the future. But it was the lost bomb that the Spanish were worried about now. It could ruin the tourist season, the country's main source of income. So the Minister of Information and Tourism attempted an audacious bit of public relations. But it was no use. Everyone was worried about that radiation, and the PR stunt was a failure. That summer, Palomares Beach was deserted. That bomb was driving the politicians mad, but the kids just made fun of it all while dancing the twist. Yet, for folks at Palomares, it wasn't so much fun. In the eyes of the world, they were like plague victims, and you could see the worry on their faces. So General Wilson decided to call the heads of all the families together. He called for unity against the communist menace and extolled the friendship between Spain and America. The villagers, intimidated, didn't dare to object. The meeting didn't solve anything. All they were told was to do what the authorities said and not go into the fields. That was the only advice they were given. So, of course, rumors were rife and people were getting more anxious by the hour. First the farmers, then the fishermen lost their only source of income. People just didn't want to eat fish. They said it was contaminated, so the boats just didn't go out. So then hunger reared its head. Serious hunger. And those totally peaceful people got angry, and they marched on the military base because they'd been hungry for over a week, their children too. 
The military realized they'd underestimated the financial consequences of the accident on the villagers. To cut people's losses, the Americans bought a part of the local harvest and used it to feed the troops. So the men were eating tomatoes with every meal. Over the following days, they gave the poorest villagers odd jobs to do. And the soldiers, moved to see the villagers in such distress, handed out their own rations to them. took to restore peace to Palomares was a fistful of dollars. But by early April, despite 80 days of undersea searching, the fourth bomb still hadn't been found, and Washington didn't want to keep on paying. Admiral Guest ordered his search teams to go over their results again to make sure they hadn't missed anything. And indeed, one witness had been overlooked. After the accident, Spanish police had questioned a fisherman. While out at sea pulling in his nets, Simo Orts had seen a strange parachute off in the distance. With no hesitation, he pointed out exactly where in an area that hadn't yet been searched. One last chance. The submarine set off on the hunt just one more time. and one last dive into unknown waters, waters that turned out to be dangerous. A submarine had to descend through a crumbling gorge where the walls threatened to bury it at any moment. Then, suddenly, at a depth of 2,500 feet, they made out a white shape. It was a parachute, with, still attached to it, the bomb. They brought it up from the abyss and onto the deck. It seemed intact, so it hadn't contaminated the sea. After three long months of searching, this was a considerable technical achievement. The 8th of April was Easter. I think it was Good Friday. They took us to Garucha and put us all on a boat. They didn't tell us anything. And we saw a ship pass by with the bomb on deck. It was going so slowly that we could take photos. Then it disappeared. This press circus was proof that the mission had been a success. First the Spanish, then the international press celebrated a triumph for the U.S. Navy. Their work done. The Americans packed their bags and left the people of Palomares to grapple with the aftermath of an event whose consequences they didn't yet fully understand. Fifty years later, the children have all grown up and the village is a thriving seaside resort. But an open wound remains. The contaminated land, 40 hectares in all, has never been cleaned up despite repeated promises from the United States. Every time I go by there, where the radiation is so strong, I feel like I'm getting a dose of it. I don't think it'll ever go away. 
We're absorbing it every day. I'm always a bit scared. All the time. With the accident at Palomares, the U.S. Air Force lost its right to overfly Spain, and that put a big dent in its deterrent capabilities. A worrying situation for President Johnson. Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara wanted to reduce the number of B-52 warning missions. They were too risky, too costly, and disastrous for the United States public image. But the generals didn't agree. For 20 years, their bombers had confronted those Soviet missiles. They represented all the military might of America. And Leonid Brezhnev, the latest strongman at the Kremlin, knew his missiles, the stars of the 1st of May parades, had enabled the Soviets to face up to the United States in the Cuba crisis. And they were also driving the space race And there too, thanks to the power and reliability of its rockets, the USSR was in the lead. The first satellite and the first man in space were both communist. Then in 1967, the Soviets launched a new intercontinental missile capable of carrying a nuclear payload over 6,000 miles. American science was way behind. We had put all of our eggs in the basket of bombers, flying, flying warheads around. America caught up, but its B-52s were still on the front line. Curtis LeMay, the chief of the Air Force at the time, said that that threat required us to go on a much higher state of alert, creating a number of dangers but we did that in order to try to reinforce our threat of retaliation. Pilot, radar, one quarter mile dead ahead. So the U.S. Air Force would now stretch its bombers and their crews to the limits to concentrate on a region that was crucial to America's security. Normally you perceive the Cold War as an east-west conflict. But when you look at the Arctic you, and you observe the, the, the globe from the top, you will see that the Arctic actually is in the middle of the, the shortest distance between the United States and the Soviet Union. So in the era of long distance bombers, the Arctic was predisposed to play a key role, actually. The United States had the foresight to put into place in the far north a huge warning system all around Alaska, Canada, and Greenland, a chain of 65 radars that stretched for over 3,000 miles. The gigantic Thule Air Base on the Danish island of Greenland had become an outpost of the Western world, sitting at the edge of a frozen sea that only thawed out for two months a year. Its giant radar was running 24 hours a day, and its sensors could detect a Soviet missile thousands of miles away. We also knew, however, that it might be the first place to be attacked. Because one thing you would do if you were um, the Soviet Union initiating a war is try to take out American radar. The radar was under surveillance by bomber flights in relay over the base both day and night on a secret mission baptized Thule Monitor. It could report back to the strategic command that Thule is under attack or Thule is just not operating and there's some kind of severing of the communications line. On January 21, 1968, the B-52 on duty, armed with four nuclear bombs, was tirelessly doing its rounds above the base at temperatures of minus 40 degrees. Some of the crew were off duty for a few hours and complaining of the cold, so the co-pilot turned up the heating. 
That's when the unthinkable happened. Three cushions that had been left in front of a heating vent caught fire. The smell of burning alerted the pilot, but the fire had spread rapidly. Thick smoke filled the cockpit. The aircraft had to be abandoned, and it was every man for himself. Unpiloted now, the American bomber would crash with all its bombs into the frozen sea. The base was alerted. They had to find the men before they died of cold. The local Inuits formed another team. At its head, a Danish civilian in charge of logistics, Jens Zinglersen. We hear that it is a B-52 with nuclear weapons that had crashed on the ice. There was no way to get out there. The fire trucks, they are constructed to to, to drive on a runway, and they cannot drive on, on, um, on Archie guys. And get my dogs and my people ready. And my theory was that our dogs would smell and warn us and may help us to find survivors, even if they were unconscious. While the Dane was rushing to the scene of the crash, Thule's fire brigade searched the area around the base for survivors. Marius Schmidt was their chief. We found one of the pilots. He was freezing. His arm was really like ice. Another had a broken leg. But we found them all and took them to the hospital. After 10 hours out on the ice, Jens Zinglersen got back to base. It had been quite a feat to get to the crash site, and he was keen to get to the headquarters to give his report to General Hunziker, in charge of the accident. But once there, he found a summit meeting in progress. And I came into a room where there was a number of high rank officers, so there was a quick, a quick glance around. And then in the middle sits here a wild looking blue white two-star general with a face like a Roman statue, arrogant. And he looks at me so down his nose and said, OK, stranger, let me hear your story. I reported short. And then he looked at me and said, God damn it, I don't believe a word of your story. And then he turned around and talked to his staff officers. I felt really pissed. A young captain came with a sort of a meter. So I put up my boot and he put his instrument there and it went sort of And then he turned to the general and said, it's true, he has been out there. And then, suddenly, the whole atmosphere changed. Now, Strategic Air Command's war machine was gearing up. It was highly likely that the four bombs had leaked radioactivity, twice as much as at Palomares. Never before had there been a nuclear accident like this one. But the U.S. Air Force just wasn't prepared to handle a catastrophe of this amplitude. And President Johnson wanted at all costs to avoid a diplomatic crisis with Denmark. Spain had allowed the Air Force to fly nuclear weapons above its soil. Whereas in Greenland, controlled by the Danes, the Danish did not approve over flights with nuclear weapons. Danish leaders knew that, to handle this crisis, they had to get on with their American counterparts. However, it was impossible to keep the accident secret because they had thousands of people working at the base. 
No one wanted to make the same mistakes as at Palomares, so a press conference was called straight away. This was a first. The U.S. military wasn't used to this kind of communicativeness, especially on such a thorny subject. Jens Zinglerson enthralled the journalists with his exploits out on the ice. They'd come from all over the world and knew nothing of life in the Arctic. Very slow down this, this area, actually southeast. But the man in charge, General Hunziker, kept it brief. How much is still on the ice? I don't know. I haven't completed our investigation. How that's going to happen? I don't know right now because I don't know the extent of the contamination. The press felt let down. Had they come so far just for this? But the aerial photography of the gigantic black stain left by the B-52 spoke for itself. A monstrous cocktail of burnt jet fuel and radioactive material all frozen into the ice. When General Hunziker and his men went to inspect this frozen swamp, they were astonished to find nothing but tiny pieces of the plane. The aircraft and weapons hit with such a force. The aircraft apparently at the time was doing close to 700 miles an hour, way above its design limits. But it did hit the ice, more or less intact, with all that destructive power. When it hit the three-foot-thick sheet of ice, the aircraft had just disintegrated. As for the bombs, who knew whether they'd broken up too? One thing was sure, some of them must have broken up. Just look at the contamination. Hundreds of employees at the base were roped in to collect all the debris scattered over dozens of square meters of the Arctic landscape. No one told them about the danger of radioactivity. They had Geiger meshes, and they found some very hot spots. I saw uh, instruments reading over two million counts uh, per minute. That's a huge dose, well above the permitted limits, even for a brief exposure. Further off, they discovered larger fragments. Were they from the bombs? Experts had to examine them all one by one to determine their function and their origin. They were looking for clues like the serial numbers inscribed on every component. And thus, three bombs were identified with no room for doubt. That much is confirmed by the declassified documents. But there was no trace of the fourth one. By the beginning of March, nearly all the debris had been recovered. Time for the cleanup. The experts said they had two months to clean up the ice before it starts to thaw. They carefully outlined the contaminated zone. It covered nearly two and a half square miles. There was a huge dispersal of radioactive material there. And so they could track the wind pattern to where everything that had been blown up in the air had traveled down that wind pattern and they knew where it was. And the Air Force there, in their cleanup efforts, removed the top six inches of the ice and snow, huge quantities. In just 60 days, they skimmed off over 10,000 tons of ice. Never had the Arctic seen such a vast undertaking. The contaminated ice was stored back at the base in some old tanks. 
the year goes on, it, the sun comes up and it gets thaw and some of the tanks were leaking, they were old tanks, they were leaking and the contaminated snow inside the tanks turns into water, it leaks out. It has to be handled maybe two or three times, moved from one tank to another. This is where Danes have had a chance to be uh, contaminated. The workers were the most exposed. They had to be checked each day. They checked us with the Geiger counter. They burned all our clothes. We couldn't keep them. They came to the barracks. They put cotton buds up my nose. We were so stupid. When the thing buzzed, we just laughed. We were so ignorant, we didn't even know what was happening. That's me on the right, with the cap. Those are all Danish firemen and Americans posing in front of the barracks there. A lot of the Danish workers there developed illnesses from the radioactivity. A lot of them died, sometimes very young. They created an association to try to get compensation. Each one of them got a lump sum of 7,000 euros from the government. Nothing from the Americans, not a dime. The survivors didn't have any illusions about the upcoming anniversary of the accident. No, we have 50 What will we do for the 50th? There won't be any more than 50 of us. We're going to eat and drink, of course. And then we'll stop. Because we've had enough. For us who were there, just saying the name Tule makes us feel nauseous. In 1968, once they'd cleared up all the ice, the Americans came up with a secret plan. In the summer 1968, to get a submarine that could operate uh, below 200 meters, a tool, they would never have done that unless that it was important to them. A declassified document from the Atomic Energy Commission shows that the U.S. Air Force was still looking for the fourth bomb. For weeks and weeks, they were combing the bay. And to their surprise, they found that there was an area covered with metallic debris. They could prove from photos taken by the submarine that it all did indeed come from the B-52. Bits of the fuselage and the landing gear had sunk when it crashed. So why didn't the famous lost bomb? The mission was cut short without finding it. And they gave up trying. My theory is that it will, it has been released from uh, its hold inside the airplane, gone through the, uh, gone through the ice, and sank to the bottom. What's still down there in the water? Each of these bombs contained over two pounds of plutonium. Is that poisonous relic of the Cold War still lurking down at the bottom of the North Star Bay? Thule was the 30th nuclear accident in less than 20 years. But faced with a Soviet threat, the strategists kept on insisting that the B-52s should keep on flying their deadly rounds. President Johnson knew what he wanted, for the U.S. to turn towards using missiles instead. But they too caused their share of catastrophes. It would take another 20 years to put an end to the Cold War. For the bombers, there would be no more warning missions. Their long reign was at an end. In 
by the spring of 68, both the superpowers had international troubles. A wind of change was blowing. For the Soviet Union, it was a wake-up call. Their empire was breaking up. In Czechoslovakia, Russian tanks put an end to all the hopes of the Prague Spring. But all over the Eastern Bloc, the thirst for democracy was growing. In the United States, it was the Vietnam War that was changing hearts and minds. A war for freedom, supported by the American people, had turned into an imperialist adventure. And defeat was already in sight. Everywhere, the young generation was rising up against the old order. They saw the Cold War, for their elders, a necessary evil, as a threat to the whole human race. They were dreaming of freedom and love. Maybe it was just a dream. The nuclear weapons weren't going to just disappear, but for the time being, the young just wanted some peace. <laughs> 